Welcome to Moo 84A, which is for acoustic guitars. And we begin today in the unusual fashion of Angel Blanco performing a movement of three prominent composers in his sphere. Um, the first is Alois Haba, the Moravian violinist turned composer turned um, ideal ideologue actually, a pedagogue even. And then we have Bruce Mather, who lives in uh, Toronto, excuse me, Montreal, sorry, from Toronto. And he is a long time composer of microtone music, tied very uh, at the hip with the Vishnogradsky Foundations in, uh, in France. And uh, then we have uh, John Winyards, who is in uh, Montreal as well, but in a different college sphere. Uh, he's in Concordia. It's a very interesting college. And he's been a microtonist for a very long time. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to, well, a little ado, I'd like to introduce Angel Blanco, who's a friend of mine since West Virginia. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, you know, been through a lot. He's been through a lot recently, and he's, he has this opportunity, and we have a opportunity for a win-win situation where he gets to play, you know, a little bit of each of these composers as an introduction. Uh, to the second annual Moo Microtonal Guitar Festival. And so with that, in this order, Haba, Mather, Winiertz, I give you Angel Blanco.
Bravo, Angel. So the pieces that you heard were Rubato Energico, and we have to take off the original sound. That was an intro uh, of a piece of Habas. Tempranillo by Bruce Mather in 36 EDO. And then a segment of uh, Microtonos by John Winyards in quarter tones that he called Islands. And with that, Angel, welcome to being the moderator of the acoustic Microtonal Festival of Mu. Thank you. Can you guys hear me well? Hey, Stefan. How are you? Taylor. How are you guys? Good. Doing good. Wonderful performance on health. So much passion. Thank you. It's just <laughs> uh, excerpts, you know, fragments of, of um, different pieces. Hey, hey what, do you, um, what, what do you call that technique? I mean, this is Raskeel, though, right? But what, what do you call the tremolo that you were doing on the fingertips of the right hand? Is, oh. there, is there a guitaristic term for that? Yeah. Um, for example, whenever, whenever you do this, I'll, I'll do it with my thumb. I don't know if you can. Yeah, I can see. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just gonna put the the, the uh, music sound a bit, okay? Okay, so but that I, you mean that th that stuff? No, the one you started one of the pieces with. It was um, you, you were you were hitting the strings with this part of the hand. Oh, oh okay. Nails. So that's yeah, yeah. Not no, sorry. Uh, yeah, that. because the one that I just did is is called uh, the dedillo or plectro dedo. The but the one that you're referring to, this. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that's uh, uh, in Spanish we call it escobilla. It's like sweeping. Escobilla. Okay. Escobilla. Yeah. Yeah, uh, pretty much. I'm sure John Schneider knows the the right term in English, but uh, we call it escobilla. Escobilla. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I never, I never knew the name of that one. Cool, cool sound though. Thank uh, you. I'd yeah. love to hear sixteen guitars all doing that. Yeah, there's there's one piece by uh, Leo Brower, the Cuban composer. Yeah, I like his stuff. Yeah, he. Uh, I think I think the the, the the name of the piece is about the sky about the about the sky and smile or something like that. And so he uses a lot of it's for guitar orchestra. So he uses a lot of the escobilla technique. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Okay, please do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Angel, our our first guest is uh, David First. Yes, yes. So David First, how are you, sir? I'm okay. I didn't know I was first, but I guess I am. <laughs> All um, right. It's yeah. in your name. So what's, uh, so, uh, okay. Okay, moderator. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So to he doesn't know you, David. He doesn't know much of your, uh, reputation uh, would, would you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself yes how you started what your track has been and where it's led you how i started well i suppose you mean as well as a guitarist i started the same time a lot of people my generation started like uh during the british invasion when a bunch of uh uh, British rock bands uh, kind of took over the pop music scene. Um, I'd say my biggest early influence was probably the late great Jeff Beck, and he was probably the first microtonalist I ever heard too, for that matter, because he was always, you know, doing very um, interesting 
uh, subtle pitch bends with everything he did, whether, you know, whether he claimed it as such, uh, you know, I never heard him use the term, but he certainly was um, an inspiration to me and to a lot of people of my generation, of our generation, I don't know. I'm not gonna start asking everybody their ages, but um, uh, he's the first person who made me wanna be uh, a musician. He was very exploratory in his playing as anybody who's heard his early playing would attest to. Uh, then, uh, then um, you know, trying to keep this brief, I got much more into like psychedelic rock when that was big. And then I got into a lot of uh, experimental jazz and uh, electronic music, uh, perhaps in the 70s. Uh, I was always into Indian music. I shouldn't say always, but quite from quite an early age, I, I got into early music. And actually, I don't know if you can see who that is on my wall, Sandy Bull, does anybody know him at all? He was, I mean, the first, he was doing, you know, Raga-esque improvisations along with Bach on the banjo. And he did a lot of, before there was even a name for it, he was doing, I guess, what you would call world music on various stringed instruments. And he was an early hero of mine on the acoustic side, let's say. So, and he also was the first person I ever heard about that actually tuned his guitar differently. Um, and then let's see. Uh, so I was always into droning, droning music from that early age because of all the indigenous cultures I was absorbing and, um, and even, you know, John Coltrane, who was also getting into droning and uh, indigenous cultural music from other parts of the world. Um, and I just kept going with it going further and further into it, I guess, as much as out. And I guess the first time I ever officially thought or used the word microtonality was um, when Harry Parch's albums were reissued in the, in the late 60s. And I heard uh, Charles Ives' two piano pieces and my buddy and I tuned our guitars in quarter tones and figured out some chords and things like that. My guitar teacher who saw that I was um, very much into exploring things like this suggested I get Humholtz's book on sensations of tone, which I've never stopped using. You know, it's just, uh, I'm, I, I imagine most of you are familiar with that. Um, and uh, he encouraged me to do all kinds, any, anything I wanted to explore and experiment with. I was, you know, he definitely encouraged me to do that. Um, at some point I formalized things a bit, learned a little bit about software, C sound, then Max, and I use that a lot in my formal compositions to create precise tunings and rhythms. I do a lot of things in my formal compositions, which is not necessarily something I'm doing today, but I do a lot of things where um, pitch relationships are also reflected in rhythmic relationships at the same time, the ratios. Um, I enjoy that experience of the global aspect of things. Um, timbre, same thing. I like to use the ratios of timbres with the ratios of fundamental pitches, I guess you might call them, and also have the same things happening with the rhythms that are going on at the same time. Uh, I also do a lot of improvisation on various instruments. Um, Harmonica, I'm particularly fond of playing. Um, I do things with slide whistles that I think are pretty interesting. And I 
sometimes even go back to guitar, which is what I'm going to do today. Any uh, Anything else I need to fill anybody in with? I have one question for just now. Okay. Just uh, uh, what, what software would you recommend for uh, like the, I, I hesitate to use the word, but I'll say it, the perfect blend of um, electroacoustic and microtonal world. Electroacoustic. Yeah. Like, meaning, uh, meaning like real world instruments. Yeah. The perfect one. <laughs> well, um, I, do you mean for performance or do you mean for recording? L live performance. Uh, and you're talking about like some kind of interactive um, situation where- Yeah, the, like, like Max or-, or uh, Well, I do use Max, but that's okay, not-, you use that's Max. not okay. Yeah, okay. But, but I don't use that so much to interact with. I mean, in live performance, the players are playing along with things that are happening in Max, but there's not that like sort of like, uh, what would you call it? Interconnection or? Yeah, I mean, they're not influencing each other. Sometimes I've done that, but actually it's not really one of Max's strengths, I would say, to hear acoustic instruments and and reflect what they're hearing. I mean, or maybe it's just not my specialty. Um, um, I'm not that interested in that. Um, you are you're more, more Max than PD? Oh yeah, I, I've never even tried PD. I mean, oh, I know okay. it's very similar, and I know it's the same people behind person behind it, but I've never used it. Yeah, Miller Pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was Max, just wondering. Yeah, no, Max is Max is great though. Yeah, it is. I, I love it. I use it all the time. Okay. Um, I, the only thing I I didn't hear is that you said you didn't say anything about Philadelphia. Oh, what am I supposed to say about nothing? Philadelphia? Nothing, but <clears throat> you know, you're not a New Yorker, though I know you from New York. So, but I just, I, you know, <clears throat> Philadelphia has its own, you know, allure, aura, you know, something about uh, the improv, uh, about allure, the, smell. Yeah, well. <laughs> anyway, uh, you don't have to go into anything. I just thought it's nice to. Where are you now? Right now, I'm in uh, Green Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Okay. Excellent. I know. I know. Great point. A little bit. Okay. So, uh, are you about ready to play? I mean, your new piece. Do you have a name for it? Uh, I call them hands. Uh, you can name what whatever you want. As far as beyond that, it could be. What's today's date? Hands three nineteen twenty three. Um, but uh, I don't have a formal name for it. I had an out. I have an album out of all acoustic guitar playing. Um, I'm going to talk while I get set up here because I realize it's not the best setup for actually seeing what I'm doing. If that's of interest, I'm going to push that back. Okay, I'll move this forward. How's that? Um, Okay, so um still not really. All right, I'm going to switch over now so that you're hearing the guitar. And be told, give me a thumbs up if, if or give me a thumbs down. Yeah, we'll do. Okay, I'm hearing it. Turn it a little bit up and that will be good.
Bravo. Bravo. I really dig the, uh, I would say the bendings that you were doing. <laughs> and uh, I, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, now you can? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, that continuum of sound has always been uh, what I've been most interested in. Yeah. I like precision, but I also like flexibility, ultimate flexibility. Um, and a lot of that comes from listening to, again, uh, Indian music. Uh, and blues and uh, I could tell like right yeah. there yeah, yeah I yeah, mean yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure like everybody in this room will, will definitely uh, see that influence of, of both like Indian music and uh, and blues but you know enough about the influence because this is very original there's nothing like this that I've heard and you know the biggest danger is because you don't have words for it, you don't use words, and then you know it doesn't get attention. But I think that uh, this is very fresh. Perfect. You know the fact that it's microtonal is beyond, you know anything, and it's not what I expected. It was much greater, only because I know the louder music of yours, where I hear beatings, you know and. I hear, you know, all kinds of different sound, you know, um, ephemeral, we would be calling it these days. So um, that's hands, huh? It was a couple of hands. A couple of hands? <laughs> I mean. Hands off to maybe you. I, maybe, maybe I should explain why I call them hands. Perhaps. I, I, um, I think of improvisation as my, my playing, like, I'm the dealer of of the cards and at the same time i'm the one who's also playing the cards that i've been dealt so every hand i get i say to myself okay what can i do with this <laughs> um and i like doing it that way because that make that keeps it challenging for me i see it's a takeoff on lady gaga's poker face <laughs> 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 it's uh um if you would have if you would have uh, rec um, uh requested that I might have stuck it in there somewhere. <laughs> That's okay. But I'm um, not really into covers. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh when I'm improvising I like to make it as I mean it sounds kind of, it sounds obvious but as improvisational as possible. I I have strategies but um i don't even know what i'm where i'm gonna land most of the time and that's why i call it like you know hands of poker because it's it's my way of saying well what have i gotten myself into now and and that's when it becomes creative for me which is like okay now i have to find a way to justify that move and how I can make music out of it and make it expressive and compelling if possible. And um, yeah, so that's why I call them hands. I, I heard, uh, I, will, I will say like, like a use harp sound on, on the sixth string, right? Like, like the sound of, a, of harmonica. Right uh, of a of a of a of a juice harp, is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, um, when I'm pressing on over the fret, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, I I sure I guess there's some similarity there. I'm playing with the overtones. Um, I also do play. Uh, okay. Juice harp. Okay. <laughs> That's one. I have, of my... a com I have a comment, uh, David. I call it a jaw harp too. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, I do. I've done stuff like that since I was a kid when I was tuning, get it all floppy 
and mm-hmm. play it. And I've released some stuff like that. And then I also have something similar where I put a the bridge in on the neck of the guitar and tune the guitar down and you play on both sides. And right. you make that effect too. So I love what you're doing. It's slow and paced and very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Hi, David. Um, Hi. Hey, um, what what gauge strings were you using? They seem really light. You just gave you all that flexibility, even. Well, though- they're mostly they're they're standard gauge strings, twelve to they're uh, Diodario twelve to what's the lowest string? Fifty two. Twelve's on top. I would have thought like nines. Or twelve's something. the top string. Uh, uh, the um, but I have it. I have it pretty slack tuning. Right. I mean, I tried. To, I have it down to a B flat, my bass string, and it's not a standard tuning uh, anyway. It's uh, it's an equal tempered tuning for that matter, but but um, because I like I like a certain amount of neutrality. I have to admit, so that I know I can go anywhere and expect the same um, relationships to to be available. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty low slack tuning that still allows the notes to speak. Okay. I hope, you know, I mean, if, if you get too slack, then you get all kinds of buzzing and fret out notes and things like that. But, um, I came up with, <laughs> I came up with it about a week and a half ago for a performance I did on Wednesday and I've been working through it. I'm, I, there's like, a sweet spot between when I get bored with something and when I'm still learning what it can do that I really enjoy. Um, I get, I get, I get not bored, but just like I get fascinated by something else, um, which is better than being bored with what you're doing. Um, So I move around a lot from instrument to instrument. Okay, so David, we're going to move around and hand off. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was really a pleasure. And uh, now we're going to uh, Siegfried, who I think is biting at the bit here because, you know, he's playing next. He's got a piece also. Um, And I think it's called Microwaves 36. Uh, And I believe it's in 36 EDO. Um, Yes, it's true. Is it all true? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in Salzburg? Right, right, yeah. Okay, in Österreich. And um, uh, Angel, do you want to say anything before he plays, or would, how do you want to go? Actually, uh, uh, I will, uh, Siegfried, it will be amazing if, if you just play, and then we'll talk a lot. Oh, okay. that's fine. All right, excellent. I'm going to play first.
I could clap. Clever. That was. Clever. This, this is a Zoom clap. This is a, Bravo. Nice. Thanks. Very, very cool. So, Angel, yes. to you. Yes, sure. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, all the the stuff, uh, the tapping technique, and uh, also the escobilla. So Taylor, right there, he was doing the escobilla as well, and, and polyphonic escobilla. Escobilla, yeah. Yeah. Escobilla with with uh, some uh, dialogue right there. So uh, amazing, amazing piece, pretty good. Um, also, like like the, the the tuning at the same time, like moving, and I, I really think that. Uh, congratulations, congratulations! I'm pretty sure everybody here loved your piece, especially Maestro Schneider that I see. He's here, and um, I'm pretty sure he will he will love that piece too. No question, no question. Wonderful piece. Wonderful piece. You know, Siegfried, I have to tell you the one of the most elegant things about the composition. It was a full orchestra. You always had at least two, sometimes three things going on at the same time. It's it, it's hard to juggle all that, and you brought it off beautifully. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Mr. You Schneider. Know, uh, when they say um, musicians have greater intelligence, you know, in the general population. Um, they usually define that as the left and the right hand being able to work independently of each other. And you did like a, a master class of that, you know, you had your left hand so independent of your right. So for such a long period. Uh, so that you're, even the falling of the paper, when you change the page for the to read, it's like fit in as so like another dimension it was like, it's kind of like a wave of fresh. It, you know, so it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, obviously you're an intelligent person, but this this is really what people say is what makes musicians have this uh, higher, you know, I don't know if anybody wants to even deal with that in a guitar festival, but. Uh, Drummers do four things at once. Does that make them twice as smart as us? Yes, because they're the ones that are allowed in, even in high school bands, they're allowed to chew gum. <laughs> You know, no other musicians allowed to chew gum. So yes, that answer is the affirmative. Uh, so you know, um, unless you want to say something about the piece, Siegfried, or anything more, uh, or if somebody has any comment or a question, we're going to move on. I have a question. Go ahead, David. This is to Angel as well, because from from the looks of things, those guitars, one of the guitars Angel was using was clearly fretted differently, but it. I could be totally wrong, but it seemed like the instrument you were just playing and the and a couple of the instruments Angel was just playing were standard fretting. So it's all about the tuning then, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. I'm achieving, so, my, I'm achieving my tonality by uh, tuning up and down some strings. That's my, my business. 
<laughs> it's none of our business or <laughs> that no, would no, no. there's no implication um, there <laughs> well, what, well, well what, what david first did and how he is achieving and, and dealing with microtonality is completely another thing and and seemed much more difficult for me uh, in in technical matter uh, as I said, it's it's rather simple uh, to achieve my tonality by only um, tuning strings up and down. That's but that's the way I do it. So you said it was thirty. I'm I'm sorry. I'm not really. Um, if I'm asking naive yeah. questions, but you it's thirty six EDO. Is that what you said? That piece. That's that's true. Yeah. So how do you? I mean. Do you have different variations on that same tuning structure? Because, I mean, it seems to me that that, I mean, is there a way to do that so that you get 36 pitches to every octave you're playing in? No. That's what I figure. No. He's got two strings that he detunes in a particular way. Right. It gives him what seems to be the majority of the 36 EDO, and he uses them guitaristically to make the most of them not unlike your hand that you you're getting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he's getting his hand he's just not calling it hand he's calling it microwaves 36 but that angel blanco breaks all the rules and puts two guitars in his lap <laughs> yeah well he'll do that right at, the end, <laughs> at the very end yes he's going to do two guitars obviously there's a lot of approaches to guitar you know, certainly when we did the basses last week, the thing I got out of it right off was it doesn't matter how many strings you use. And also this reaching for going up among the bass players. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. One, one thing, if, if I may add, and, and uh, commenting on the, on the first uh, question and at the same time, for example, this guitar is, uh, is a standard, as you can see, it's... Uh, standard classical right but the tuning uh a secret is this one is like like him uh what i mean is is 36 edo as well this is the bruce mather piece this is a bruce mather piece so i'm just gonna um i'm not gonna play i'm just gonna just gonna uh, strum a bit but uh, just let me put the uh, the uh, sound uh, for for music <laughs> Mm. Oh, cool. yeah. So, so that's this because Bruce Mather prepared. Well, yeah, he prepared the the, the tuning, you know, to be able to play that. So, what is the, uh, what is the tuning? The strings, the open string. Sure. So this is uh, the six is is a me e, right? And then the fifth is supposed to be a sixth uh, higher, and then the four is a third higher. Correct, right? And so, and and for the other ones, it's a it's a D, and then a six higher, and then a third higher. Now, uh, the the gauge here uh, is a bunch of six strings, like three six strings and three uh, four strings. So I can have the, well, I mean, the mother can have its uh, powerful e sound. E and D strings, basically. Come on. The, the the low E strings, three of them, and then the D string, th three of yes. those. Yes, yes, uh-huh. And so you really uh, have to commit to that piece yeah. then. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this, this, is, it's only for, this guitar is only for that piece. Uh, and so uh, the other guitar, first, this is a quarter tone, st standard quarter tone. So that this one does have the uh, special uh, fretting. Right. 24 EDO. Angel, where did you get this guitar? It's quarter tones, isn't it? Yeah, Only quarter tones. Quarter tones. Where did I get this one? Yes, I, I'd like to have one. <laughs> oh, ah, uh, uh, well, actually, if uh, my my luthier from Mexico, from Monterey, he made it back in 1999. Oh. But I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, say here that 
John Schneider, he works with a guy in Los Angeles, right, John, that he makes these special guitars? Well, that's Michael Kudirk, and he's right here. Michael is here. Kudirk is, is already here. Great. Yeah, so he we're going to sure be speaking is. to him momentarily. Okay, so he will be the one. Right, great. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right, so, but, then, but hang on, hang on, Siegfried. You know, it's the simplest thing in the world. Your luthier only has to add a fret exactly in between each already right. present one. That's the easiest micro micro fretting you can do. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you just need to decide which <laughs> which instrument you're going to sacrifice. Yeah, exactly. But then <laughs> Stefan Garretts is also here, and he'll show you a trick about how you have to color some of the uh, the the spaces in between so you don't get lost okay <laughs> yeah it's complicated the the left hand like uh, i use the, the julian carrillo system which is numbers but you can use many different ones uh, as uh, and john schneider is saying with colors and uh, because the, the technique does change a bit angel okay. you asked me a question about software before i'm going to ask you one what, what do you use, or Siegfried could answer this as well, what do you use to tune your instruments? Oh, what, what do I use to tune my instruments? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there, there, there's a bunch of websites actually uh, where you can tune the, 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 uh, your instruments or even, even this sim uh, simple one, Inve Malmsteen uh, uh, Tuner. Mm -hmm. Fender. You just learn the deviations, or there's not there's not a way to to uh, uh, program that for micro tunings, right? Or no, 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 no. Like this is uh, universal, but uh, uh, I mean, in the in the different websites, uh, you can you can have uh, uh, like particular. So you're on stage somewhere. <laughs> what do you do? Well, well, uh, like I tune, I tune, of course, uh, uh, with 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 this machine, mm -hmm. and uh, that's it. Because I I pretty much know already what what I'm gonna I'm gonna do. Like this, like this quarter tone, if I'm playing Haba or Carrillo, uh, they, they use standard uh, tuning. Okay. And so for Bruce and some other so, someone else, you know, I I uh, I use the websites. Uh, I'm gonna in the chat chat uh, room right here in the chat box i'm gonna write down the website that i personally use and uh by all means everybody's uh, feel free to you know share information i wish somebody would invent a programmable tuner but i've never seen one i have an i have an app on my phone that i that i can you know at least look at sense or or uh hurts david I there there are quite a few to oh, oh, oh actual pre-programmable tuners you have really? to go into the world of piano tuners they yeah. have apps where they have 15 20 30 different temperaments and you can customize it to anything you like right steven was put, holding up and, and it'll actually like tell you when you're spot on one of those yeah i mean they're, they're in uh, increments of five cents they have quartz memories i think korg oh. was the one that started that off First, they used to have you actually tune the machine to a tuning fork, but then they came up with the quartz tuning, and then they ended up using that in the New York Philharmonic with Joe Robinson, the oboe player, using the Korg tuner on the music stand. And, you know, even though it's in groups of five, the thumb, I used to do it all the time, could spin this thing so you can get one cent accuracy. So, I mean, that, and then they went out of business. You can only find them on eBay. And then, you know, all the other kinds of things have happened. Um, so, but I want to move on because we have so much we have to do today that if we just keep talking about tuners, even though that's important. You yeah, know, uh, just for the record, Johnny. Put questions in the chat and we in can. The chat right there is the website, okay? Right there, savage.com. Yeah. yeah, we should use the chat. And also, let's mute when people are playing. No, nothing's happened yet. It's important. And so now we're going to go to uh, yes, Brian Abbott. Sure. Uh, and we can come back to some other issues, but we just need to keep moving. Uh, Brian, um, hello, Brian. I don't know, Angel, if you know Brian. Um, Hi. We have met before, I remember. Yes. Once or yeah. twice. <laughs> twice, right? I think so. In, in Ottawa, right? Yes, that was it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, fine. That that's uh, um, what guitar is that one? So this is a thirty-one tone. Equal it's a thirty-one tone. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, the frets get very close together and dizzying up here. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so uh, um, would you like to play and and then talk about it? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all yours. Uh, yeah. Break a leg. I'll just say a quick thing. It's like um, I'm basically playing a truncated version, like little sections of a larger piece. Um, sure. Yeah, I'll just play it. Thank you. 
Bravo. Bravo. Thanks. I think, uh, Angel, you, oh, we have to shut the original sound there. Thank you, Brian. I think uh, Angel likes to do what I do, which is we like to hear the music first because you know something about the person. But here, I, I know Brian a little bit. He's a member of Moo. And I heard this recording that he made uh, that's on Bandcamp, which is all electronic music that sounds acoustic. But then you get to hear today the real thing where he's playing acoustic. I knew it was going to be special. And of course, it's 31 tone, so we get into a new area. Um, and you can you can uh, unmute Brian. Um, just I didn't want to, the original sound to echo. Cool. And uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, that was great. Um, is, is, are there any questions or thoughts or, I mean, it's a straight fretted instrument, so that's not an issue. A lot of uh, Arabic wood sounding playing. Yeah. Well, I really loved it. Thanks. Yeah, a little bit. Um, with all those frets, you can almost get like. I mean, the illusion of a continuum, like it was like a true glissando sound. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like throwing, I like glissandos a lot. So it's a good opportunity for that. I really like it. Thank you. Is that a standard tuning? You're using a standard guitar tuning? Um, it's almost standard tuning. Um, the D string and the G string are like approximately a six tone flat. That way I can get a really nice uh, harmonic seventh when I want it and uh, a nice like minor, like low minor third, like a seven over six kind of almost close, like close to it, pretty close. So yeah, it's just out of tune enough that when I give it to other people to try, they go, these two random strings are out of tune. And then I go, no, it's not. <laughs> what brought you to explore that tuning? Uh, it was total, well, it was, serendipitous uh there's this kind of uh there's this older guy on the i mean i'm living in toronto there's this older guy on kind of the uh toronto experimental music scene and he shows up to people's shows and sits in the back and falls asleep and uh one day he came to one of my gigs and just gave me this guitar like randomly and then i did a little research on 31 tone and uh i realized it was a temperament that i liked very much because you can get there's a lot of, uh, you can get really nice in tune thirds, you can get really nice in tune harmonic sevenths. Uh, you can get like pretty close to like 150. Se there were like a lot of intervals in it that I really, some of my favorite intervals were in it. So it was, it was very serendipitous. So yeah, so it started out as chance and then I got really into that tuning. I was doing just intonation just before that. Um, well, I still do just intonation, like write compositions for it. And, uh, but yeah, I really fell in love with this guitar and played all the time, yeah. Very cool. All right, so now I, I would like to suggest we move to Michael Kudurka because he can make these guitars. Yes. All right. So cool to hear all these different things people are doing. Is my sound okay? Oh, yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I got into uh, this kind of thing. Um, about 15 years ago, I was playing a lot of period instruments, lute, the orbo, things like that. You know, instruments with where the frets are gut strings that are tied around the neck and therefore movable. Um, being kind of new to those instruments, I didn't really think about it too much. I just, you know, was learning how to improvise from basso continuo and didn't think about the tuning until I got hired to play um, a gig doing continuo in Henry Purcell's Dido and Aeneas a great you know, English opera from the 1680s, I think. Um, and the conductor, um, uh, who's a Baroque cellist uh, from Brussels, uh, casually said the night before the first rehearsal, you know, I landed, went to see some of the dancers practicing, and he casually said, oh, by the way, we're doing the whole opera in quarter comma mean tone. That's OK with you, right? And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. That's perfectly fine. I'd never heard of it before in my life. <laughs> I had no idea what that was. So I stayed up much of the night <laughs> uh, figuring out at least a little bit of what it was and then basically got to the rehearsal two hours early in the morning and just sat at the harpsichord and went note by note just moving my frets around until you know things were basically matching up. I didn't really understand any of the theory behind it uh, but um, I did find that 
my Theorbo sounded better than it ever had before. I was just instantly hooked on just the beauty of the sound of this. And um, uh, that was a short phase of my life doing early music. I'm you know, primarily a classical guitarist, but I was so hooked on the, these sounds that I knew I needed to bring it back to classical guitar. And I've known John for many, many, John Schneider for many, many years. And uh, back in LA, uh, you know, I was playing on some of his instruments from his great collection. Um, and the one that interested me the most was the, um, the, the switchboard system, you know, using the kind of refrigerator magnet material. And it was a piece of sheet metal on the neck so you could uh, switch uh, fretboards quickly because, you know, in concerts and stuff, you don't have to be, if I want to go from one tuning to another, it has to be fast. Um, but, you know, um, there are a lot of issues with that design, uh, primarily the issue being that the guitar just, the, it doesn't sound very good because the, the magnetic material is rubber, basically. So it absorbs a lot of the overtones, you know, the more subtle uh, frequencies from the guitar. So, you know, it's kind of like, what's the point of making your intervals in tune if the lower notes don't have the harmonics <laughs> to lock in? So I, I basically wanted to take that idea, but basically just start from scratch and reinvent this idea of interchangeable fretboards with an eye towards uh, making the guitar sound as good as a regular guitar, you know, just tonally and in terms of its sound quality. Um, so I was doing stuff on my own for a few years, but found that the DIY approach, um, I just couldn't quite get there. Um, so I ended up basically realizing that the way to make this work would require some real funding. And so I partnered up uh, with a couple people. We got some, basically the way to make this really work was to form a company um, that had a, you know, somewhat reasonable business plan to make these kinds of instruments. and you know, and therefore get some funding to actually do it properly, to like really, you know, get the engineering skill behind it to make them for real. And so we've done, we've done, um, so we've been selling classical guitars with these interchangeable fretboards. Uh, I have a quarter comma mean tone one on here. Thought maybe I would just play a little uh, lute piece by John Dowland, and then we can maybe talk a little more. Is that all right? Okay. I guess I'll turn my original sound on, yes? Bravo. Thank you. 
there not so, to love about that? W- sorry, what's that? What is there not to love about that? Yeah, I know. What's, what's there not to love? Um, I'm going to have to raise my hand. Okay. Because Me now, too, Tony. <laughs> you too? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I you know. Want, do you want to go first? Or should I go first? If you want to. Okay. I mean, as this piece is beautiful in Quattro Comamento, actually, John Dolan developed his own irregular or uh, loot fretting. Yeah. So, yeah, there are many uh, ways to fret a Renaissance loot. And of course, you know. Yeah, but John famous... Dolan developed his own uh, t- uh, tuning, especially yeah. for, for his music. Yeah. yeah. In other words, what, what he, Witzelt is saying is we have these recordings on guitar uh, by Wim Hugerwerf where um, it's in the actual John Dowland tuning. Mm-hmm. And to our ears, it's different on Quarter Common Mean Tone. Yeah. Now, of course, this is a similar kind of thing. We have all these different early music tunings, and the issue that we're bringing up is matching them. And, of course, it's not a criminal activity to use any oh, tuning right. for whatever you, you want to use of course yeah <laughs> yeah. Sure, you know. yeah yeah make, make sure you know and you played lovely and and it's nice to hear quarter comma mean tone and it's its own thing though it is close to 31 tone it's a nice follow right um and it's really up to the players knowing which is the right tuning and unfortunately the entire loot world this is not guitar world this is loot world yeah. They pay no attention to it themselves. Right, right, right. No, so I just want to be clear that, you know, my sort of approach in performing and recording these pieces is not to, um, you know, attempt to achieve any kind of, like, historical exactitude. Exactly. You know, obviously, I'm playing it on a guitar <laughs> with interchangeable fretboards. Exactly. It's exactly. not a loop. So I sort of see this as just adding another dimension to uh, the interpretive process, right? So when I play concerts, I'm not there just trying to give a, a buffet of tuning stuff. I'm trying to play, you know, music that has many other dimensions. And, and, so and of course, the aspect of the interpretive process is to say, oh, uh, 19th century music, even though guitars were pretty standardly set up, you know, in 12 EDO by then, uh, wouldn't Giulio Rigondi have been interested in maybe hearing what his music would have sounded like in a tuning like, say, that Chopin was playing in, you know, at virtually the same time. So it's like basically entering a realm of the imagination. Right. Uh, you, you, know, have, you, have, I... you don't have straight frets, for example. That wasn't available to them. So you're doing something already. It's a progressive innovation. And it's yeah, understood. Yeah. Understood. We're and just pointing out this one maybe... composer. Yeah, and we're really yeah, yeah. being specific to this <laughs> name. Right. Like you didn't say you were going to play a piece. That's why I ask, because oh, okay, yeah. you would not have, you would not have had this reaction. Okay, maybe I should have played some Francesco da Milano. I didn't know what I was exactly. Play, so. It could have been as simple as that. <laughs> but and and you know and, and Vitzel did say it first. So yeah. it's not you know I you know I, I, not, <laughs> I'm, not that I'm throwing Vitzel under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Maybe that'll be the next fretboard I make. I'll make the. Uh, hey, uh, it's a great yeah. idea. I mean, uh, yeah. Vitt, yeah. Vim used the interchangeables, and if you want to hear them, they're on Bandcamp. Just look under. We'd have to yeah. actually uh, tell him. Maybe you could find it, Vitzel, and put it in the chat. But right. uh, you'd get to hear these. Uh, we have two or three pieces of Dowlin, and it's such a difference again mm-hmm. to our ears. And mm-hmm. not, you have to kind of be open to even hearing it that way. Yeah, right, right, for sure. You know? So, so uh, to kind of get back to, um, you know, what our company has been doing, we're called Microtone Guitars. And basically our design looks something like this. I mean, it's not going to be too shocking to this kind of group, but basically I can just do this. Um, I maybe won't go into all the details of the engineering that went behind this and why, you know, our guitars, you know, sound really good. <laughs> But unless people have questions about it, I might be able to answer. Um, you know, I have other fretboards. Here's a fifth comma mean tone. You know, if I'm doing like Baroque string music, like the Bach uh, violin sonatas and partitas or something. Uh, Pythagorean fretboard, um, you know, for doing medieval music and even some uh, contemporary pieces that are sort of using a lot of fourths and fifths, things like that. I have a Jean Philippe Rameau, Temperament Ordinaire, if I'm doing other Baroque music. It kind of goes outside the range of, you know, sort of a chain of 12 fifths. And if I need, you know, some more 
color shadings to different keys. Oh gosh, I have such a collection here. Lou Harrison, you know, the uh, 11 Limit Just Intonation from the great National Steel guitar. Uh, uh, a lot of great repertoire for that. Um, various Five Limit Just Intonation schemes. I even have a few in the other room. I have so many different Five Limit ones, I didn't even want to bring them all in. I've got this one. Uh, weird, right? The thirds are 14 cents sharp on this one, so it's a little weird. Uh, That's my crotonal. Yeah, I know, I know. And I wanted to show you guys these two, which are not fully done yet. So these are for a, a customer in Miami, Federico Bonacosa, who has ordered these, and they're almost done. We're going to be shipping his guitar and fretboards out soon, but take a look at these. Wow. Oh, yeah. What is that? Oh, gosh. Um, a, I think one's a 22 note per octave, just a, a just intonation scheme that he developed. He's a composer and a wonderful composer and great player too. Uh, one of them is 22 tones per octave, the other's 19, and it's, you know, just some lattice that he put together. Um, yeah, he, he, would, he would know all the relationships. Like, but you can see, I mean, they, these, these are probably the most complicated ones we've made. Um, we sold a guitar and some fretboards to someone in California a few months ago who had uh, ordered a, um, uh, one of Irv Wilson's tunings that had not yet been manifested on a guitar fretboard because it's just too complicated. And since you know, our engineering, we're doing things with CNC machines and it's all, you know, you know, we're cutting fret slots all by machine. So they're really precisely located and the fret wire is being, is fed out by machine and cut really precisely. So we're able to do these really like kind of anything somebody can imagine. Um, like Michael, are these interchangeable or just each guitar? Oh, wow. No, so, yeah. So that was one issue, you know, for me as a player, I, I knew I had a few kind of things that I required. One was I could not spend two hours in between sets of a concert to you know, move little fretlets in channels under the strings. I right, can't do that. So I need, that, need them to be fast. Um, I needed them to obviously not change the tone of the guitar because you know we want the guitar to sound good. Uh, and also I knew I couldn't be carting around three or four, much less buying three or four guitars because if I had to have a different guitar for each tuning I wanted to play in, A, I'd run out of money, <laughs> and B, um, I think I would have to get lower quality guitars because they would, it would be too expensive. So, but instead, I can have one like great guitar, like put all my money into one awesome guitar, and then just get different fretboards, you know, wow. for, for like a few hundred bucks each. And you can switch them in a manner of yeah, so uh, I'll just do a quick demo here. So let's say I've got this fifth comma mean tone, and let's say I play the famous Bach Chaconne, and it all sounds great, you know, and then I finish the Bach Chaconne, and I do this. And when I play concerts, I just have like a little piano bench just to the left of me. I just do that. And then I, oh, sorry, that was the Pythagorean one. Apologies. Let's say I just played some, some uh, I don't know, Guillaume de Machaut. And then I take it off, and then I do this, and I'm going to play some Bach. And then I go, I either, you know, I'll have to adjust the open strings a little bit, right? Like in the Pythagorean, my open strings will be four threes pure. And in the mean tone, I'll have to widen my fourths a tiny bit based on the temperament. But it's, it's faster, you know, guitarists, we check our tuning in between pieces anyway. And I can change fretboards in less time. It even takes me to check my tuning. And so, I'm, yeah, I've been generally doing concerts like kind of in four sets. So the first half, I'll have to do two different fretboards. You know, maybe some Renaissance limp music in mean tone, some Bach in either a fifth comma or or some Baroque temp keyboard temperament. And then on the second half, you know, maybe more new music uh, in some just intonation scheme or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there would be a lot to say about the engineering that went behind it, but I don't know, maybe the best thing would be to just open it up to questions or if anybody has. I, I have some questions. Yeah. Uh, are, are you familiar with the uh, Humphreys Millennium guitar? Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is this is a Kenny Hill, and it's a similar kind of design. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Because my dream. This is a, a Millennium as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, my dream guitar, like for classical, will be like a mixture of like a Millennium type of construction and quality, with at the same time having the. Uh, like the scallop fretboard. This is an Inbay Mumsteen model, right? So that stuff. Yeah. 
What do you use yeah. the scallops for? Do you do like pressure bends by, is that what they're for to, you know, you can press uh, harder okay. and the pitch goes up? Yeah, yeah, like uh, on the electric guitar, I use it a lot for, for tapping reasons. Mm. Yeah, but- um, You can kind of uh, like dig in more with, with, you can really tap- Because deeper. of the nails, to be honest. Oh, okay, okay. Because if I use a standard electric guitar when I'm tapping, it's, 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 it will destroy the nails. I hadn't, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. I'm not much of a tapper anymore. Oh, okay. Stop doing that in the nineties, but that's just me. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, uh, for for the for the acoustic for for the for the classical, it will be amazing to to have to have it. But uh, a bunch of luthiers, when, whenever I say, well, you know, I'll 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 I would love to have those those uh, uh, scallop necks, and they go like, well, you know, we, we need to to put it like a like a metal bar inside the guitar and this and this and that because otherwise it will be difficult. So. This is kind of like a luthier question for you. Is it is it doable? Oh, it's totally doable. I mean, for one thing, you're talking about a classical, right? Like a classical guitar. For one thing, there are more and more classical guitar luthiers that are putting a two-way truss rod in the neck. That's becoming more and more common. There's nothing wrong with it. I think a lot of classical guitar luthiers just like doing things the old way just because it's been done that way. It doesn't mean it's better. So this guitar has a truss rod. Kenny Hill puts truss rods in all his guitars, and it's great. So I live in northern Michigan. Everything's covered in snow. The heater's on. It's super dry. So when the neck moves a little bit, I can just make a little adjust, adjustment to the truss rod. Okay. And in the summer, I can make another adjustment, and it's all great. On our guitars, we do also add two very, very thin strips of carbon fiber on either side of the truss rod, not directly next to it, but you know, this, we basically cut two channels with a little bit of wood um, just to give a little more rigidity because with this removable fretboard, the layer that's on there, I don't know if you can see that, it's quite thin. And so that was something in our years of prototyping um, uh, that we found that the neck did need something to help support it since we're losing you know, about five millimeters of you know structural support because they're removable um so again that was you know one of the things on, on my kind of list of of things i learned from john schneider's you know that the the switchboard guitar from and john i'm, I'm blanking on who made that i'm sorry oh tom stone invented it yeah tom stone right and uh and it's a mattingly guitar right oh that's right yeah so you know, that was one of the things that I think, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I believe that the neck is has started to bow up significantly, makes it somewhat hard to play in seventh. No, no, the neck has been fine. The only oh, okay. issue was the sound, which is why I put a piezo in it, right, to, oh, okay. to compensate for what's lacking yeah. on the fingerboard. Yeah, that probably helps, but I guess in the end, even a piezo is not going to give you those harmonics, probably, but I don't know. Um, yeah, we're just, so we've just been selling classical guitars so far. We've made two steel string guitar prototypes, uh, not for sale or anything, but we are just now partnering up with a really great electric guitar and steel string guitar builder here in Traverse City, Michigan to finally <laughs> start making electric guitars with the, in this interchangeable fretboard system. I mean, for the last, I feel bad. It's been at least two years now, we've just been getting emails and emails from our website. Do you make electric guitars? And I always have to say, no, sorry, we're working on it, but we don't want to sell anything unless we've prototyped it a lot and make sure that it's really good quality. So we're finally at that point now. What's your price range? Uh, for the classicals, we've been selling our guitars like kind of as a package, like a guitar and any three fretboards you want for 4500 um, and then the electric guitars, I think we're going to kind of come in somewhere around the 4,000 territory, but the guitars themselves, I mean, th these are not Squire strats. These are like amazing handmade electric guitars, like with gorgeous finish. I mean, they're really like kind of incredible instruments in their own right. Again, the, uh, was, like, it yeah, sounds like a Lumitone coming to the guitar. It may be, maybe. I think what they're doing is so cool. Actually, I was going to ask uh, uh, one of the previous person if he had ever done anything with this 31 EDO guitar and a Lumitone, because I know a lot of people are doing 31 on Lumitone. But uh, yeah, yeah, so that's what we're doing. I'm really excited about the electrics, you know, because, well, I don't need to tell you, you all, but I mean, you can imagine like some of these harmonic relationships, you know, cranked through an amp, you know, with like all of 
all of those harmonic interactions, but just, you know, to 11, how great. Could hey, that Mike, be? a quick question. As you know, John Cattler has for years made available switchable entire necks that bolt on and off. Is there any reason why you can't make a, a Fender compatible that will have your system on it? Yeah, so that is something we've made some prototypes of those. A uh, couple issues. One of them just has to do, it's a little bit legal. It just has to do with licensing. So if we put anywhere that they are Fender compatible, like we have to basically pay them a licensing fee. Like I could tell all of you in this room that they're Fender compatible, but if we put it on our website, you know what I mean? Like in order to actually advertise it as Fender compatible, like in print, we would have to like officially license it. Or and that's just a business question, whether or not it's worth yeah, it. Because the amount of sales me, you would get would be ridiculous. Yeah, I know. We, we, might, we might do it. If it was just me doing a DIY thing, I would say like, yeah, sure. What are they going to do? Uh, sue me for what? You know, but since we actually have like a business and we have two patents for our, you know, design because uh, it's really completely different from the interchangeable fretboards that have been out there before um they may look similar but like kind of under the hood there's really a lot of engineering in there um but yeah i agree fender compatible would be the way to go um i think maybe at some point but i think what we're going to do first is just work with this great electric guitar luthier and just make guitars that have the interchangeable fretboard system it's also kind of nice it's a little control thing because then in the shop we can make sure that the setup intonation everything is set up perfectly for the fretboards whereas if we just ship out a neck you know we don't know is the person who gets it going to intonate it correctly is everything is the action going to be set up just right so it 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 does feel nice to like get it all set up in the shop 100 percent feels great intonation is perfect and then ship it out That's also questions. why we don't do retrofits so many people have asked us can you just send me like just the thing, I have an old guitar, I'll rip off the fretboard. I'm like, no, we don't do retrofits. A, because odds are you might mess up your old guitar. We don't want to be responsible for that. Um, and B, uh, yeah, there's just like, it's a lot more involved to get this all working perfectly than just like gluing on something in a DIY kind of way. Uh, Mike, that, so. Michael, if you um, want to stay on with the electric session, and okay. then you can talk more about the electric at that time. That would be, be great. great. Uh, I would like this mo moment, though, need to move to the next person to be within the time frames. And uh, Stefan Gerritsen is here. Uh, I know that you play in 31 tone. That's supposedly the national tuning of the Netherlands. And I you know like, once you unmute, I'd like to hear your response. Yes, you can hear me now. Eh? Yes. Yes, in fact, well, like the third one, we have this uh, Huygens Fokker Foundation in Amsterdam, and we have the Fokker organ. So that's, and of course, one of the most important inventors of the third one ton temperament was Christian Huygens, and he was a, a Dutch scientist of the 17th century. So yeah, we have the, the tradition in that sense, but it's still like a small minority of people who are <laughs> involved in this, also in the Netherlands. And are you working with it yourself? Uh, with the 31 tone temperament, you mean? Yes, yes. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you say. Okay. All right. Try sesame opromo music. Sorry? Try sesame opromo music. That's the uh, title that uh, they used for the uh, Fokker album when it came out with Webster College. Translate that into Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's Latin. Try sesame opromo. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> by, uh, the, by Fokker. Yeah, sorry, I was completely lost. <laughs> sorry. It's a linguistic issue, I guess. <laughs> so, and you have a piece to play. Well, yeah. Um, so, what I would, would like to say, I uh, this is so the second one I was playing something on 31 tone guitar, but in my case, I make it a bit simpler for this mm -hmm. occasion because I have here a guitar. Maybe I can, you can see me here. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, you should say right away that you are left-handed, so people don't get ah. freaked out. <laughs> left-handed, yeah. <laughs> so you this, guitar. Um, this guitar has a selection of the, the 31 tone uh, notes. Um, in fact, it is like uh, it has the most of the enharmonic notes. So I have here uh, F sharp, and then the next fret is then the G flat. 
or a G sharp and an A flat. But I don't have the, the other notes in between. I have an electric guitar and another acoustic guitar, just as my, uh, um, I forgot your name, the other one, beautiful playing on the third one, Tom. Brian Abbott. Brian, yeah. So I have that guitar as well. But for now, I would like to play not something uh, Renaissance, but really uh, something contemporary by uh, a German composer, Joachim Schneider. I don't know if you know him. He wrote some pieces for uh, the Fokker organ and also for Ensemble Scala and for my trio Scala. And he wrote this piece, which is uh, called Drei Gassenhauer. And I think he makes very nice use of the, well, of course, the limited possibilities of this uh, microtonal instrument. And he uses especially the, well, like the, the, the nice seventh harmonic. That chord is like the, the, the moment that, or the, the chord he uses all the time to make uh, enharmonic modulations. So, um, in fact, he's doing the same thing in three movements, um, but it still sounds very different. The first movement is uh, like a, a cycle of modulations in a more rhythmical uh, staccato uh, fashion. And then the second movement is maybe a Gassenhauer. A Gassenhauer, we know maybe the Gassenhauer trio by Beethoven. So it's like a, a classical, um, it's like a typical cadence of the classical period, like Haydn or an early Beethoven, but then in an um, enharmonic uh, modulation. And then there's a little, very short kind of tarantella at the end. So dry, Gassenhauer. Now I have to put a just one. Theory. Yeah. If the sound is correct for playing. Uh... Good.
Bravo, bravo. What can you tell us about that piece in general? Well, yeah, what do you want to know? Because it's, uh, I already explained a bit. It's, uh, he uses the, um, yeah, this, this dominant seventh accord, but then with, uh, yeah, 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 yeah that, dig but, into that. Yeah, exactly. So he, he plays the seventh harmonic and then he uses, for instance, this is a B flat, a D, and then not a H flat, but okay. the G sharp, which is very close to the seventh harmonic of, of the note B flat. Uh -huh. And that's what he's doing to make a different kind of modulation. And that's what he's doing all the time. Right, so okay, okay. Yeah, this chord. Uh, and then. Uh, Mm -hmm. Let me start from the beginning and you can, you can hear it. Uh, uh, this is maybe, so I'm in E minor and then I, I play the G, the, the minor third, so the G flat becomes the seventh F sharp, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A flat chord. So you have this. Ah, okay, okay. All the time. Okay. That's great. Thank you. It was very it was very cold when I entered uh, here. So I just turned on the, the heating and now I'm sweating and it's getting a bit out of tune, but uh now yeah. That's uh great chord progression, so That's yeah, lovely. wonderful piece. Yeah. Oh fluid. It, what's the open string tuning? It's uh, but what uh, Brian told it's it's more or less the same. So like it's a uh, it's not a squadratura tuning. It's a, just a regular tuning. Only of course with the tuning uh, you make the difference between the like the 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 chord the the fifth or the fourth so a bit different, but only slightly. And what I normally do if I play uh, um, I play a lot of old music uh, in my regular concert programs. So normally I start on this instrument and play some Renaissance music or even Dowland uh, or some early Baroque. Uh, and what I normally do, I just, I, I, I'm i sure that always the, the octaves are all in, uh, I know of course every piece what I want to hear. And I'd be sure that all the octaves are at least perfectly in tune and yeah, then it works fine. So normally I don't- case, you are 31, you're using uh, 31 equal uh, fourths. Uh, that's to, what I to, that's what I have to do. But very often, of course, in a concert situation, you have to tune, and then what I do yeah. is like I, I like all the all the the, the octaves are uh, I check so like in a normal piece. You also have to uh, to check always uh, some chords. But yeah. you know, like with my twelve tone ears, you you can be mistaken. So uh, I am all sure that all the octaves are uh, perfectly in tune, and then then it works fine. Okay, so I'm going to now actually stop the recording so we can then start it again, which will be the beginning of the next session. We actually did it exactly at what is for me noon, 12 noon. I'm in California. So um, just uh, now shut the recording.